we want this grand experiment of freedom to work for everyone. Yes, I think that's what we want to do. Can our nation meet its perhaps its most difficult test? And that test would be not to overcompensate for injustice that was perpetrated by the elite of the past. A lot of post-traumatic stress disorder of our country having dealt with this indelible stamp of injustice for a very, very long time for our black citizens, post-slavery world, Jim Crow, just unspeakable, unbelievable horrors of young black men being in the wrong place at the wrong time and being wrongfully convicted or not even being convicted, being lynched. You really read some of these tales, it is absolutely beyond. Personally, I think the radical Republicans should have had their way and kept the army down there in the South for much, much longer. According to the Tuskegee Institute, more than 3,400 blacks were lynched between 1882 and 1968. More than 1,200 whites were also lynched. There were also mass lynchings of Chinese, Italians, and Mexicans. The ten vigilantes were indicted by a grand jury and sent to San Quentin, but on appeal they were released on a technicality. In the late 19th century, journalist Ida B. Wells demonstrated that many of the crimes that the victims were accused of were either exaggerated or had not happened. After the Civil War, before 1892, black communities were thriving and successful, placing stress on education. The communities that our black citizens were building were successful, raising very educated young people. Families were solid. In fact, there were more black members of Congress in 1870 than there were in 1950. And that's because the Jim Crow laws stipulated that black citizens could not run for office. It was the local laws. That is an abuse, clearly. The 1920s saw a big resurgence in the Ku Klux Klan and in racism. There was even a Klan march in the streets of Washington, D.C. Woodrow Wilson, he screened a completely racist film in the White House screening room called Birth of a Nation. It was one of the very first feature films ever made. And it was made by a friend of his who was glorifying the Ku Klux Klan. And the whole movie from beginning to end is a moving trope about black men having baser instincts and Ku Klux Klan protecting us and our society. Actually, 1920 was when the uh, burning down of Greenville, Oklahoma, which was a really thriving business sector with businesses owned by black Americans and it never recovered. It was leveled. A young man was accused of perhaps assaulting a white female adolescent in an elevator in a hotel, a black owned hotel, and he was arrested and then some World War One veterans, black World War One veterans. He got ready to defend the courthouse because it was being mobbed by a lynch mob. He wanted to lynch this, this fellow who was being accused. I mean, it was a real mess. And then I guess one of the black World War One veterans maybe fired a shot or something. And then the whole situation, all hell broke loose. It was this article published in the Tulsa World that most historians agree was responsible for sparking the violence. It accused Dick Rowland of somehow assaulting the elevator operator. Some accounts claimed the young man accidentally tripped and ran into her, or that he accidentally stepped on her foot. Others even claimed they were in love. But the fact remains that charges were dropped three months later. Some say that the young woman exonerated him in a letter. Some accounts say that a white man tried to grab the gun of one of the black veterans, whereupon the black veteran fired a shot. The violence broke out, and they brought in the National Guard, even with an airplane to quell the violence. Every black citizen was rounded up and put at the fairgrounds for at least a month in a work camp. But as all this was going on, the headlines in the very next day after the massacre said that the Tulsa leaders were going to rebuild the area with half a million dollars. At first, the good news made national headlines, and people from all over the country donated. But 
The Tulsa Welfare Board did not want the donations. In an effort to save face, they put the word out that no donations were necessary. They even returned several donations. And incredibly, in less than 10 days, all talk of rebuilding Black Wall Street fizzled. Everything had been about optics. Now, do we want to perpetuate that type of injustice or do we want to learn from the mistakes of the past and apply the Constitution and the law with full, complete facts and a media that is fair and does not try someone before they have had their day in court? So there are many myths about Kyle Rittenhouse. Much of the news coverage talked about how he had an AR-15 style gun that was semi-automatic. Well, Gage Grosskreutz, who was the only man shot by Kyle Rittenhouse who lived, who shot in the hand or forearm, he testified he had a Glock pistol that was in a holster at his back, also semi-automatic. I don't know if you knew that. And what semi-automatic means is that you can fire multiple times. You still have to squeeze the trigger. It's not a machine gun, quote, or automatic weapon, but it means that you don't have to cock the gun or reload it before shooting multiple times. And there's a myth that his mother drove him across state lines so he could show up with a gun. That is not true. He had been working on the 24th at his job as a lifeguard, and then the next day was when they went and prepared to help because they saw that nothing had been done the night before. His mother didn't drive him, he drove himself to his job. Where he and his mother lived was Antioch, Illinois, which is one mile from the Wisconsin border and about 20 miles from Kenosha. Complete facts. Apparently though, his mother did drive him to turn himself in after the whole thing happened. So that is why I go for the hidden and not so well-known facts. Another issue going to Rittenhouse is that dispute about whether Joseph Rosenbaum, the first person to be shot by Kyle Rittenhouse, whether he was running away or was shot in the back. Today was the first I heard that Joseph Rosenbaum lunged for Kyle Rittenhouse's gun. That was told to the jury by a man named Richard McGinnis. He was a videographer for The Daily Caller. He said that he saw Joseph Rosenbaum lunge for the gun. The prosecutor was saying, oh, and didn't he fall? Richard McGinnis said, no, he lunged. He did not fall, he lunged. But then like a news article after that was saying that McGinnis was saying, well, he kind of lunged and then he fell. But the way that article was written, it sounded like he was already falling before Rittenhouse shot him. And so that's another thing I want to point out that happens with journalism, and that is that timing of events can be manipulated. So you here you got like the spin of omission, you have missing facts, you have other facts pushed prominently, what some would call cherry picking. And then you also have the sequence of events could be altered by a spin of omission, not necessarily actively altered, but passively altered. So that's why just because you hear something that confirms your bias does not mean that, it, that it's the absolute last word on the situation. We know that Rosenbaum had threatened him earlier in the evening. We know he had also seen a group of armed men and he was caught on video screaming at them to shoot him. Go ahead and shoot me. Shoot me, nigga! Shoot me, nigga! In 2002, he was charged with 11 counts of sexual assault on five boys who were under the age of 12. The grand jury charged him with that and it was very detailed. He pleaded to some of the charges and he served 12 years for that. Now, I've heard a lot of people saying, you know, oh, he shot a convicted pedophile and he shot this other guy who had a record. Personally, the only reason to bring up somebody's record when they're a victim is to to show that it is possible that they were engaging in a pattern of behavior also at the event in question, but not ever to say that they had it coming. And I feel like some conservatives and other pundits who've been talking about the case, I feel like it's they may be not intending 
to be basically saying that the, those who were shot by Rittenhouse had it coming. But it kind of sounds like that. And that really doesn't do any favors to for human rights and for the Constitution and complete facts. It's not like he was a Boy Scout and all of a sudden he just went nuts. But just because someone is a Boy Scout and they're a police cadet and a, a firefighter cadet, and a lifeguard doesn't mean that they can't be a twisted murderer. But that is why I think this case was so interesting and so important, is we have the whole media accusing him of basically looking to kill people. I mean, people are still calling him a white supremacist. Not a good situation by any stretch of the imagination, but as always, I ask you to look further than the superficial, than the divide and conquer. We don't want to destroy it because up until now, it hasn't worked for everyone. We want to be honest, forthright, righteous, eyes open, complete facts, complete history, told with kindness, honesty with each other, and mercy and compassion for any opinions that the other might hold that are ridiculous. <laughs> or to us appear ridiculous. So I'm sure there's something I forgot to say, but there was a lot that I did remember. And I just hope y'all have a great night and I really thank you for watching. Thanks so much, guys. All right, you have a wonderful night and a good sleep.